John Chen. So glad to have you here. <laughs> Thank you, Miriam. How are you? I am very well, and I'm a little bit hot. We're going through a heat wave in Europe. How hot? How many C? I think it's easily 30 degrees um, Celsius inside. Do you want to hear my best hot story of the year? Please. Uh, here in Seattle, we had a heat wave, 90 plus Fahrenheit, right? And um, so air, there's not very many air conditioners here in Seattle. And so I'm about to produce a program. I actually have five computers running for the first time and my air conditioner. And what happens? Blow a fuse. Oops. It's kind of metaphorical, right? Like humans, like we blow fuses, right? And so anyways... Uh, luckily for me, I've already created, a, I've I've uh, installed an uninterrupted power supply, so my computer kept running. But the air conditioning didn't. Well, no, the air conditioning didn't, all right? And, um, and then my uninterrupted power supply starts squealing because uh, I overloaded it. I plugged too many laptops. Like, the la all of the other laptops were plugged into the uninterrupted power supply. And so I went and um, turned up back the fuse so I could get all the power back. And then because the program is just about to start, I had to make the decision to not run the air conditioner. <laughs> and in 90 minutes, my office went from 72 degrees to 91. And then it feels like a hot yoga class. <laughs> <laughs> and everything worked, yeah, everything worked perfectly, but this is just like another one of those, you know, we just come and be vulnerable, which is like, uh, Every time something changes in your environment, you'd have no idea if you're going to encounter a new problem. Yes, yes. And if just the color of your T-shirt changes over the duration of the workshop, everything is good, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I'm actually producing this program. I actually wasn't on camera, right? So I wasn't having to show like, you know, spots mm -hmm. or things or anything. <laughs> that's, that's my summer heat story. Love it. And I am interested in another story of uh, when did you start calling yourself a facilitator? A facilitator. Wow. Uh, when did I start calling myself a facilitator? Well, now it's over 25 years ago. Uh, because when can I say? Uh, probably around 97 is when I wrote my business plan. Like I was already kind of facilitating and what I mean by that is that I was I had a career at Microsoft uh, prior to starting all this, starting in 1990. And even prior back to that, I was facilitating. I may not be, have called myself a facilitator, uh, but uh, even in college, I was um, uh, arranging skateboard teams, right? Uh, I was also the president of Engineering Student Council. So I was already kind of leading and facilitating for other people, all right? My definition of facilitator is to make make easy mm -hmm. uh so let's see going on into 1997 I, I wrote the business plan for my company and i started to professionally facilitate uh part-time while i was still at microsoft and it took me two and a half years to to finally leave microsoft to become a full-time facilitator and i'm happy to announce that miriam this is my 25th year of my company wow congratulations Thank you. The stat in America is less than 4% of all companies make it to 25 years. Wow. And thank you for making the distinction between facilitating and facilitator and kind of carrying this role and being proud of it. And interestingly, what I just realized is that many of my podcast guests started facilitating somehow in college very early in their lives without knowing that there was something special, a special role to what they were doing. So it seems to be an inner calling or maybe a personality trait. Yes, yeah, so it could be it could be inner DNA that you're naturally doing it, you're you're led to it uh, without knowing what the title is until mm. some point you decide to, you know, make a change and say, I want to do this, you know, more of the time or all the time or full time. Right. Mm. So when you wrote your business plan, was it immediately all about virtual meetings and virtual facilitation? Uh, no. Do you want to, let's see, do you, do you want my uh, last two years in three minutes? Absolutely. Okay, cool. Thanks for that. Um, so 
I became the author of Engaging Virtual Meetings, right? Because I want to tell you a little bit more. It's not that I switched during the pandemic, right? I just want to show you where did all this stuff come from? So uh, it was a little bit like this. I started with this face-to-face -face team building. And in fact, we actually use a, a you know geocaching, a high-tech scavenger hunt uh, mm -hmm. around the world to teach team and leadership skills. And so I used to do about 120 events a year face-to-face. -face. And then you know this little thing came around. And this is not really good for a face-to-face -face business because I had 15 canceled programs of March of 22. So Miriam, I had to go back back to my history when I was facilitating, right? Is that I was on this thing. I mean, if you don't remember what this is, this is like pre-AOL, right? It was the first graphical-based uh, meeting space. So um, just for the audience that is not seeing the video, we are seeing Prodigy, which is which looks like a very old school computer game. It's an online uh, spa meeting space like America Online, and its notion was it was the first graphical based um, uh, meeting space. And uh, this is, uh, Miriam, what I love to tell people, this is when modems used to make noise. Right. <laughs> I remember these days. This is very good. That's very good uh motive. Yeah, fax noise. Okay, so uh so yeah, so I was on this a long time ago. And so what that meant is is that I looked into my history, I've been meeting online for 35 years, and in fact, I wrote a book called 50 Digital Team Building Games in 2011. So for decades I've been trying to tell Miriam that we could do this, that we can meet online, do meaningful work, save the travel and expenses, right? Have dinner with your family, right? And friends at the mm -hmm. end of the day. And everyone said, well, that's a great idea, but here's a bunch of money and you need to fly to Orlando, right? Which is mm -hmm. as far across the country for me as possible. Anyways, I'm sitting in my office with nothing to do. And um, just one second, I, was yeah. it just Tony Robbins who hugged you on the picture that you showed? Yes, th this is a very good observation. This is actually a picture where I was able to give a hand signed book uh, of my book, which I feel he's a little responsible for because he helped me start this company. This is again Tony Robbins, and this is was actually shot in Fiji at his resort. Wow. And so uh, I appreciate you know talking about facilitating too. I think this is one of the the turning points for me was. Um, to go a little further into that, which is I actually was doing great work at Microsoft, and then I got put on six canceled projects in five months. And the problem, Miriam, at the end of that is that at the six canceled project, I started to believe it. Mm. What I mean by that is that people used to make jokes at work, and they're like, oh, if you want a project canceled, just put John on it. <laughs> All right. And by the sixth program, like I started to believe it myself. And that's the crusher, right? That's going to say, right? so I was like having problems of like being motivated at work. And so I, I decided like, I don't want to feel this way. Uh, I saw the, you know, Tony Robbins commercials and I said, I want to go there. And the law I went, of attraction, right? And that's basically what he also preaches. Yeah. Yeah. And I you went there. What you and, asked for. I had my I had my guard up too. Like as as a technologist, most of us have a um, very high need not to be manipulated, right? <laughs> as a technologist, and so like I went in there and I was very surprised. Within sixty minutes, he had converted me over, going, oh, "I actually think he's authentic and he's what he's saying is real." And within sixty minutes, he had people like throwing pills and cigarettes and and like stuff they didn't want to do onto the stage, stuff they wanted to get rid of. I'm like. Okay, I, I'm interested, right? He's creating change in a very short amount of time. Mm. And sometimes on a mass scale. And I go, that would be interesting. I would like to learn how to do that. And so I, I went through a number of his programs and got to learn that. And that's why I was able to give him a book back. Uh, I have a really cool other side story. Uh, I got called by his foundation and he was stuck in Vancouver, Canada. And he wanted to, he'd run something called the Basket Brigade every year. This is where they give back uh, food right, to families because it turned out when Tony Robbins was young, he was poor and somebody came up and gave him a basket of food and his parents tried to give it back going, we, we can't accept this. And the guy goes, hey, I'm just the, the delivery person, right? Nice. My job is just to deliver that. Yeah. And so he never, he never nice. forgot that. Yeah. And now he literally helps people feed, feed millions. So That's I was- That's a facilitative act. Oh, yes. Right, a give That's back. It's facilitation. You were trying to make it easier for people who are hungry. Yeah. And so uh, that millions of people do it. And he, uh, the foundation asked if he could fly to Seattle from Vancouver and if I would host him. Mm. And I was only given five days notice. So I dropped everything, right? And for five days, I helped plan this. In five days, we were able to feed 1,600 people with no budget. Wow. 
there was no organizing budget, right? Like I, everything was volunteer basis. All the money donated went straight to the family. Wonderful. Yeah. And so anyway, so that's, that's what made a big impact uh, on, on my life. So, so yeah, so this is uh, one of the things that he learns, he teaches too, is that flexibility is power. And what I mean by flexibility is like, like coronavirus is, is one of these things, which is a disruptor. This disrupts all these patterns that, you know, right. Actually, before the program, you admitted to me that you're a little OCD and OCD is a really a helpful thing because it gives us the, the stability, all right, uh, of, and predictability of something. And coronavirus wiped all that out for yeah. almost the framework and within it, we can be chaotic and experimental and flexible. Yeah. Well, and this is the moment, right? That flexibility is power. Those who, what I've called, I told people, those who failed faster in coronavirus, I think, succeeded more. Mm. Isn't this generally true? Those who failed more often are more successful because they just tried more often. They're going to have more life experience. I sh I'm like 99% sure. The challenge is, is that I, I, I'm, I'm really trying to be honest around this because you can tell people to fail faster, but there is kind of a caveat. And the caveat is you need to fail faster without a catastrophic mistake. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because a catastrophic mistake can really have long lasting d damage. It's traumatic. Yeah, it's traumatic. Yeah. Yeah. So, so when I say fail faster, you got to do that and then see, is there a way that I can fail faster, but in a way that is somewhat safe, mm -hmm. right? And I mean, it's, it's not without risk, totally without risk. There's some risk for sure, but not so much risk that if you fail that like everything, right, goes away. And so I, I, that's why I really want to try and um, manage those two. That's my personal life experience now with fail yeah. fast. And I think the, that's why the fast is so important. Right? Because if you fail fast, this means that you fail only a little bit. You fail with a prototype, and then you can improve it. Um, so that, that's exactly what I did with this, which is I put a class up called Virtual Team Building on Eventbrite. I gave it away for free. That was my intuition talking to me saying, um, you know, just give this thing away for to free as like a gift to like for people to deal with coronavirus. What I love to tell people is I don't make vaccines, but but I can make your virtual meeting better. Mm. We've been collecting ideas that, that we tested over the last, you know, two, three decades about where the way virtual meetings were, but nobody would, um, nobody was interested. Nobody was interested yeah. until this moment. And so, so in this case, uh, we finally put this on here, right? And 5,000 people took the class. Oh. And the 5,000 allowed me to fail faster. Like in the heyday, I was running this class every day at noon Pacific Standard Time. Amazing. And I, right. I've actually delivered this class probably six, seven hundred times now. What have you learned from that? Uh, my number one, I think I'll love uh, I think you'll love out of this is that it took me 17 times to get the class to end on time. <laughs> what know, made the right? difference? What made the difference? Well, number one was cutting. <laughs> right? You have Killing too much darlings. stuff, right? Cut, cut the stuff. And um I, I love to tell people that like as an entrepreneur, I, I'm guided by three passions and that's technology, adventure, and human change, mm. right? And if it doesn't have those three things, like I shouldn't be doing them. And I, I've said no to ideas now. Some, and that's what I'm trying to get to the idea. Sometimes it's harder, but more valuable to say no to things than to say yes to things. Mm -hmm. And it's like what we were talking about earlier. It's almost easier to do a second, 60 second interview than edit a one minute video because that editing takes a lot of time. Or you just commit to record only one minute without the editing. Yeah. And that's, then you get the both the best of both worlds, right? Then that's a fail faster going, right? Exactly. Just and then you put that. That was my learning from starting to produce these short videos that if I produce so many, every individual video is less important to be perfect. Yeah. It has to just deliver one core idea. That's what ten, yeah. that's where TED Talks really got its, you know, deliver one really core idea in 18 minutes or less. And that was like revolutionary when it came out. And now it's standard. Yeah. Right. Well, now 18 minutes is too long because nobody can focus for 18 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. That, yeah. We unless, should talk about, the, we should talk about the, <laughs> the short attention span of the world. Right. Yeah. Uh, you said unless. Unless they're in a facilitated session. Yeah, because um, so because I think what you have to do is, uh, you know, in, in, like in the engaging virtual meetings, you need to buy them in in the first minute. Mm. In the first minute, most of us will make our decision. 
whether or not are we going to listen to more or not right you know i hope like in my first minute i said do you want to hear a story and then by being vulnerable and telling about a time that i you know failed that you'll go like okay now i'm interested because you know i think most of us learn more from failure than we do from from success and like, sure. when, we're, when we're successful we're like yeah of course i'm so great <laughs> and i think it's um also when we hear about success whether we want it or not, I think there there are parts of us that m might become envious or jealous. So it's uh, we don't really connect and remember the successes of others, even if we want to be these wonderful people who are happy for others. Whereas yep. when we hear about their failures, there is more there's empathy related. So we relate to emotions, positive emotions, um, and I think our brain just remembers. Okay, you better listen because it could apply to yourself. And and I think, you know, number one is really talking about ways to make virtual meetings more engaging. One of them is vulnerability, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Like this happened in somebody else's um, meeting. Uh, a gentleman, I think, either spoke or chatted that, that um, one of his family members was diagnosed with cancer. And the whole meeting changed. Mm -hmm. And then the chat started to blow up. And the chats was all support for him and his family. Right. We're thinking about you. Can anything to do to help send me your address? I'm going to send you some food. Right. Or your friend, your family's members and things like that. And and it was amazing the amount of engagement. Right. That you can get from that. And yes, it's it's beautiful at the same time. And let me play devil's advocate sure. for real. Sure. So um, it's beautiful to see the compassion. And still, if you do have an expected outcome or you want to achieve something in a meeting, something like that, as you say, can totally deviate and can bring a different, how do you get from that back to business as usual, to something that feels so mundane and mm. almost irrelevant after such an announcement. So as a facilitator, how do you deal with the chat exploding with compassion? And you actually sitting there like, we have a decision to take. You know, that's actually a great part. Uh, every facilitator has to wrestle with this and and has to great, create their own guidelines. And here are my current guidelines around it. Number one is that, um, and I learned this while program managing at Microsoft, right? So as a program manager at Microsoft, that job is to help design something and it's helped kind of like negotiate between uh, developers who are making stuff and testers who got to like make sure the stuff works, right? Mm -hmm. And... Um, we, in Microsoft, we called them tangents, right? Tangent means like, this is the direction mm -hmm. of the meeting and then somebody takes either a left turn or a right turn. And I think tangents are, are really valuable because only humans, you know, I think, uh, are uniquely capable of tangents, which is this divergent thinking. Mm -hmm. So, so as a facilitator, I need, I feel like I want to let them go to a certain point. And then I got to feel like like I'm. this is part of the job of the facilitators. You're filling the room around it, which is if there's a lot of energy, keep going, right? And and also then you can do a check-in, which is like, I'm going to diverge from this thing that I thought you know was our goal. But this thing that we're talking about is now so important. Does everybody agree? And then you can get validation that everybody's going on that track. Mm -hmm. right? uh, or you stop it and say, okay, that's a great idea. I'm going to park that idea at that stage. Right. And so we can come back here, but I'm, I won't lose track of it. And so that's really I think if you do that, those are all things that the audience will appreciate it. You know, ways to not do it is uh, shut the conversation off in the middle too quickly without checking mm. in the audience. Like they really actually, you know, again, the energy is there. Yeah. You got to re read that part or um, or you go on that tangent so long that, you know, like half mm -hmm. of your audience or more checks out. Yeah. Yeah. So what I hear and it's. <laughs> It's a good example, a good visual actually with the tangent because the tangent is the straight line that touches a circle, right? That's a tangent. So it is still connected to the content. Yeah. Um, so as long as it still touches, but then if it goes too far, it goes somewhere to the moon, right? And that's not where you want to go. Um, and what I hear from what you're saying is, Okay, acknowledge what's happening in the chat and that there might be something that the group wants to talk about that is more important right now. So acknowledge yep. that, ask them, okay, do you want to continue to be in that space? Do you maybe yep. need a break um, in order to shift gears or do you are you ready already? So basically yeah, like to give them agency. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, give them choice or what we sometimes as facilitators call the illusion of choice, right? Which is give them three choices. And But the key here is as a facilitator, you're okay with all three of them. Mm -hmm. I love your take a break, right? So the other one could be, let's take a break, right? And for 10 minutes, you can either walk away, take a break, or you can send as many messages to this gentleman as you'd like, right? When we return, we're going to come back to our business. Yeah. And now they feel like they got it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. So, yes. Uh, well, I love the, the you know, the, it's an art. There's a science and an art, I think, to facilitation uh, with that. And so, and, and this is what I discovered in this, this program here, which is that when, after 5,000 people went with the, through this program, number one, that was a fail faster. And number two, it showed me what people responded to very quickly. Mm. Right. So there's what? something that I did that lower our ideas and, and like, you know, it didn't work. Right. Is it like it was 2020 was different than, you know, 2015 or whatever. Um, and so it didn't work. What was uh, the most surprising finding that people and I do have these moments very often that I fall in love with an idea. Oh, I'm going to do this. And then nobody responds to it. Right. So it doesn't land. What was your most surprising? Um, uh, let me advance because then I'll, I'll, share, I'll share how we get to the most amazing piece, right? So so that's this, which is my publisher came back who published the first book and said, hey, do you want to write your second book? I'm like, sure. Uh, the best joke that comes now, Miriam, is that they didn't know how long coronavirus was going to last. So they made me rush the book. <laughs> Spoiler, <laughs> alert. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. It's August 15, 2022. It's still going on, right? <laughs> um, so I wrote the book in uh, nine weeks. Wow. And it came out in October 2020 and hit the number one Amazon hot new release. And so now I'm going to complete the story. By the way, this is now what's, what I call tracking, Miriam. So Miriam asked a question. I needed to diverge for a few minutes on this other path that I was on. So I can, but, and, and the key here is to continually track to make sure that I address Miriam's question. That's something I think that's critical for great facilitators because um, they can, uh, they can track. They can track things that the, the group is wanting to do. And even though you don't do them in the moment, your group will give you agency or give you some freedom if they trust you and say, see you, make energy to kill. I will address her story. So she asked for the most interesting thing. These are some interesting people I worked with. Uh, Jay Bodasinga from The Walking Dead, uh, the author. I was his producer. Uh, Robert, I'm sorry, um, Patrick Lencioni. All right. He sold six million books for the five dysfunctions of a team. Uh, this guy, uh, Damon John, of course, is on Shark Tank, sold a billion dollar you know, clothing company. But this is the story here is Elizabeth Gilbert. So do you remember Elizabeth Gilbert? Isn't it from the comics? No. She wrote a book called Eat, Pray, Love. Oh, and yes, then, yes, yes. Of course. Yes. Then Julia Roberts played her in a movie. Yeah. And it really kind of started a movement in the world of, of like being introspective and like trying to discover who you are. Right. And so Elizabeth Gilbert uh, got to be the keynote in a in a conference that I was speaking at uh, the one production note. She had great pieces here. Uh, the one production note is I helped her um, get a better microphone. Right. It kind of sounded like she was in a bathroom. And then I, I said, do you have a you know, do you happen to have a better mic around the house? She goes, oh, yeah. Hold on a second. She walked away, came back. And she goes, you mean like this? And it's like literally a pro USB microphone. And she plugged it in. Right. And, and her voice like changed. It sounded like this. You mean like this? <laughs> <laughs> and the whole audience, like this is the rehearsal audience, like the, the stakeholders are here and some other her agent was there. And all of us fell over on the floor going, her voice quality just completely changed, right? It makes such a difference. Yeah. And it makes such a difference because what I want to share about Elizabeth Gilbert is that she entranced an audience in a virtual keynote for 45 minutes and she used no additional tech. She didn't use breakout rooms. She didn't use chat. She didn't use poll. It was amazing, right? All she did was, right, she's got a right camera. She's got lighting. She's got an interesting background. It was like an in-person background. And then we changed her mic because what she did was really focus on authenticity, vulnerability, right, and storytelling. Mm. And the proof of was 38 minutes into this keynote. Somebody chats and goes, I feel like I'm having a one-on-one -on -one with Elizabeth Gilbert at an Italian cafe. And 650 people were logged in. That's amazing. Yeah. It is amazing, right? Because yeah. we're possible. all the, mm 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're the ones. That, again, I'm for, I'm definitely the first one who says, oh, you should be using Mentimeter or a chat or like some other technical tool. And it really, I actually now have finally designed a program called um, Improve Your Your you know, virtual meeting with no additional tech. And I run the talk with no slides, like all this fancy stuff. Like I said, I'm showing you all this fancy stuff for those who are on camera with us. And I'm not show. I don't show any of that for, for 60 minutes. I talk about the eight points around this keynote. Awesome. I recently, I gave a, um, a workshop, a training, um, and I don't like slides. I hate using slides. So I use these slides. I just yeah. wrote wrote down kind of my stuff on A4 paper. And as I was changing the slides, I was showing the slides into the camera. And the participants loved it. The audience loved it because it makes it tangible. It's you connect the physical world with the digital and somehow it helps you to connect to the audience. Yay. Yes. And now we have to give a, a props to our good friend Jimbo Clark for coining the term fidgetal. Yes. Right. Which is the combination of physical objects with digital uh, has something for us as humans. Um, you know, and I I love the slide technique. Um, uh, what was the other one? Oh, we have a friend and she created something called Just One Word. Right. This is a my friend, Kathy Armias, who's a, a TED Talk coach in, in Portland, was trying to debrief a group of 50 people, but only had a short amount of time. So she just thought, like, what can I do that's different than chat? I already did that. Right. And so she got everyone to get a piece of paper. And get a thick marker and write like one word. Mm. You know, and her two questions were really deep. They were, uh, how are you feeling now in coronavirus? And they were very vulnerable, right? Scared, right? Depression, uh, isolated. And then she goes, what do you think you need to get through coronavirus? Love, connection, right? Ingenuity. Uh, and so, and the screen was full of that, right? She's in gallery mode. We got 49 screens full of these unique words of which you could read out and debrief from. And I think those those are the genius things that uh, came about. And th- so that's what I'm saying, that like fail faster. She actually did that and it turned into a hit. Mm. And I've given that hit now to many other people and, and it's had the same response almost universally around even in different countries. Uh, and there's this quality that's different about it because like in a chat, it's always that text, right? But when you write something out, some people sometimes put graphics on it or they put like, you know, Seattle, like a space needle or a coffee or, you know, all those little small touches is what humanized, I think, the debrief. Yeah. And to build on that, I would be curious of your explanation for that. Similar, there's this exercise where you ask, um, everyone to cover their camera with a sticky note. And if they have different kind of colored sticky notes, then you have almost a mosaic in the gallery view. <laughs> and then, and it looks beautiful. And then you ask them, um, yeah, and like this, it's just kind of gray, but otherwise, uh, if you have pink stickies, anyway. Yeah. And then you ask yes, no questions. And especially for very large groups, it's a nice exercise to get a sense either to melt the ice or to get a sense who read who read the report before showing up to this meeting and who hasn't, right? Just to get a sense. For whom is it morning time? For whom is it evening? Who's having coffee? Who's having gin and tonic? Um, yeah. To know in what kind of mental state they are. Long story short, yeah. the, the difference because you could do exactly the same with turn your camera off or, off or on. Yes. It would have the same outcome, but it doesn't have the same effect. It doesn't yeah. bring the smile on the faces of the participants. So what is it? Well, I think in your example, too, what happens is is that to participate in this, you have to turn your camera on. But what you can do with this is saying, go ahead and first, you know, cover with a post-it and then go ahead and turn your camera on. Because what it does is give permission to people who didn't want to be seen mm. the ability um. to turn on the camera, but it's covered so they feel better about it. Thank right. you. Yes. Value yeah, because- bomb. Because I was gonna, I was gonna tell you that somebody did it right with camera on, camera off, and one of the, one of their secrets is the last question you ask is kind of a universal on question, right? Yes, question, mm. 
Therefore, what happens is most people will have their camera on and this person never told you to like turn your camera on for the purposes of this meeting. They said, turn your camera on for the purpose of, of being the involved. Exercise. In mm. exercise. Yeah. And your post-it is like another. So this is what I love here too, is that in fail faster is um, I've now had to teach the difference between creative thinking and innovation. Mm -hmm. right? I'd love to hear like, do, do you, do you have a difference in the, in your personal definition of creative thinking and innovation? You mean me personally? Yeah, 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 yeah. For me, creativity is connecting existing ideas in a new way. Does it necessarily lead to innovation? Not necessarily. That's right. That's right. In in the version that I've had to teach, that what they say is, and these are somebody else's definitions, but it's um, creative thinking is all the ideas, right, that you can generate. Mm. But innovation is the actual implementation of yes, the. Thank you. And so, like like this now is an innovation. And the best part is, I haven't heard of using the post it as part of this, right? So to me, this is a new innovation. You know, for instance, if I was to write about it, I would I would give you. I've, I credited a lot of people uh, in my book for giving me stuff that just worked. Yeah. And again, it's the small distinction. So your distinction about using a you know a post it um, is it, again might have this added benefit which is, an, again, it allowed people to turn cameras on, but feel a little safer about it. And I guess, you know, the key here too is like, even I could choose to do something or nothing. It's like, well, after I have my posted, right, I could just peek, right? Mm -hmm. Which is like, <laughs> you know, there's a, like you could show a different color or something else. Again, if you, one thing that's super important to me, Miriam, is, is that um, I have a class called turn on the damn camera, right? <laughs> Which, and the joke about the class is like the worst way for me to ask Miriam to turn on her camera is, Miriam, turn on the damn camera, right? <laughs> Which is like, she's, she's already reaching for the, the like, you know, turn the camera off. I, my, I have a very strong belief that people participate in the way that they want to participate, yes. whatever that is. Yes. Right? And that, that even in your initiative, even if it was uh, with, well, with a post-it, Again, if you don't want to be seen, like maybe maybe you change colors of post-its for yes and no if you do not want to be seen, right? Uh, yeah. So something like that. So again, it, there's a way so that uh, I, as the facilitator, am giving everyone a choice about how to participate. Yeah. And I think, yeah, the explicit ask is almost intrusive because you also don't know what's going on in the space of a person. So, um, and maybe someone is just sensitive to visual overload and needs yep. to turn the camera off or turn their back to the screen or whatsoever in order to really focus. So who are we to judge? Um, on the other hand, I think on assuming that we all long for a sense of belonging, that's a universal human need, right? We want to belong one way or another. And I think these... If we can create a sense of belonging within the first few minutes of any online session, then we got them. Because for, for me, the worst um, or the biggest trick is to avoid them to open a tab or to go down a rabbit hole within the first five minutes, because then you just lost them. Yeah, because they made the decision that either this is not engaging or important to me and therefore I can just listen passively. Mm, and they cannot. Okay? And then they go somewhere else and then they can't. <laughs> and now, now you, you've lost them. Like they, they're logged in and, and, and Miriam, this is no different than being in person. Yes. Right. In virtual, it just looks different. Right. Which is I could turn my camera off or whatever. Right. But, in, um, but in person, they can be in the audience and still be completely checked out, especially now with phones. Yes. They're right? either on their phones or you see it on the resting faces or they never come back from the from the coffee break. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They go out for, for coffee. I do have something very funny, though. Here, hold on a second. Let me see if I can actually show this. So and I'll describe. OK, I actually did put this together. So uh, what this is here and now you're seeing is a button that I call away. So all I did was record myself <laughs> in a virtual meeting. Now, you know, here's the real secret about this, why you know this is not working. So what those who, who can't see this is I'm running a video of me <laughs> participating in some other virtual meeting. So I'm actually looking around and, and it looks like I'm being attentive. 
but now the kill the the total tell is that my vo my uh vocals are not matching my lips right <laughs> and so this was this the way button uh that i i occasionally use it's mainly a joke i like again but somebody actually did this for like almost uh at least half a year to a year and nobody knew that he was not actually participating and that that's hilarious that. but i think that's the facilitator's job too for me this if somebody was doing this to me i don't think they would have get through my 60 minute class without me catching it yeah right mm -hmm. i would try and address that person at some point i'd be like hey john right oh that's so cool i love that hawaiian shirt right and when i see they don't respond to him like Wow, John, are you serious like that? Hey, do me a favor, hit the chat, right? And the, and they want, you know, like I'll ask for some things, and eventually I'd most likely discover that they are actually not really there. And I would be very curious to be the, I would love to be the fly on the wall to see how you would actually act on that as a facilitator, because you you are already putting the person on the spot. I mean, yeah. they are tricking you. Yes. So and you are putting them on the spot but then how how do you deal with it you know in in some ways it's like um uh one of my theories around uh, virtual meetings too is everything's okay mm. you know if that's what you want to do and like fool us that's fine because you're not getting the value out of this class mm. yeah and so what i do with it, and then as a facilitator right when i notice that i'm like you know now If you didn't know, then you really have to like think about what this is. But now, like I've seen this, so I'll be like, "Oh, I see. You most likely have a video. That's pretty crafty, right?" And I'll appreciate that as opposed to call them out, you know, for something bad. I'm like, "Oh, that's really, you know, we've heard that, you know, other people have done this. And that's mm -hmm. that's amazing. You had me. Uh, I'll I'll give you a credit that you had me for at least 12 minutes. <laughs> so that's what I would do as a facilitator. So it's it's an acknowledgement, but it's still like it's an okay. Right. Although that person, if they figured out that I called them, would go would most likely remedy the situation themselves because they would go like, oh, yeah, you're, you're right. I'm not participating fully. Yeah. And then we thinking how. How much are we actually um, taking ownership of our own time and our decision and multitasking? Well, Miriam, let me let me give a real situation in this case. So I was in a 1200 person conference. There's probably 600 people logged in. And one of the the goals of the conference was to engage and interact with every attendee before the end of a meeting. And so this is a 60 minute keynote. Right. And um, there's like 200 people working together to make it feel engaging for 1200. Right. And so one of our strategies is while the keynote is running, if we like um, all the there's like six or seven people, they're assigned different letters of the alphabet. Mm -hmm. so this one person right, reached out to somebody and going, uh, actually, I think it was me. I reached down the middle. I'm like, uh, hey, Joan, right? Uh, how's, uh, this is uh, John, the producer. I just want to check in and see how the conference is going with you. And I didn't hear anything back. I'm like, okay, that's fine. Uh, and so two days later, in a break, she called, She goes, oh, my gosh, John, this is Joan. And I'm like, oh, hey, Joan, what's going on? She goes, I just want to tell you a story. I said, you chatted to me two days ago. Right. And you asked how he's doing and I didn't answer you. And I said, look, I was just doing some other stuff. I got caught up. I was at home and I'm like, oh, yeah, that's fine. That's okay. And he goes, no, I just want to let you know. First thing I thought was, are, did you are you able to turn my camera on? <laughs> she thought I was looking into her with. And then afterwards, she she thought about that going. She goes, uh, she thought about it and she goes, man, I'm not I'm not I'm not really maximizing my investment into this conference. So mm -hmm. I'm going to clear all my tasks out of the way. And for the next couple of days, I'm going to really focus on the education. Um, and so she said, thank you for that. Yes. One one private message with a huge impact. And maybe not only that conference, but any other conference she will sign up for. And very nice example. On the other hand, and we talked in our exploration call about chat and that you said that chat is one of the most underestimated engagement tools in online meetings. And I am very curious to hear more about that because I'm also aware of the distractive power of the chat. So for instance, if John, instead of washing her dishes or multitasking, writing emails, maybe she was so engaged and captivated by the content that she didn't even look at the chat and didn't want to 
give you feedback. Yeah. So what are the pros and cons of the chat and how to use it in a constructive, enhancing, engaging way instead of a distracting way? Yeah, my belief is that chat is the second most engaging tool on virtual. And the first one is this, the camera and the mic. <laughs> okay. We turn it on, we start talking, it's pretty <laughs> engaging, right? The second one is chat. And chat's special property is that it allows almost it allows everybody to participate at the same time. Because this is the challenge. Like at least Miriam and I are like, they're two of us. So, but even you know, two people, you'll find sometimes it's challenging. Like I'm having a thought, but John keeps talking. I don't get you stop, please, so I can get my thought in. <clears throat> and it gets harder and harder, right? When you get a hundred people and like, sometimes there's never an opportunity to talk. And so I think chat is one of those ways. Um, so my guidelines for chat is show chat early and and you have permission. I tell the audience, right? You have permission to chat any questions and comments that 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 you like. And again, then I add the caveat. If you're one of those people where chat is distracting from your goals from attending this conference, just close it. Mm, agency. And I checked, right? Because early on, right? Early on, again, there were no guidelines, Miriam. And so um, one conference had people who started chatting and they were really against the conference organizers because there was a bunch of stuff that was like, had technical problems. And so their answer to that <clears throat> was to turn off the chat universally. Because mm. I just didn't want to hear the negative comments. And I was like, wow. And I did a poll. So I, I've done my own polls with this. And I did a poll. 44 meeting professionals came back. I said, chat on or off? And they all said 100%. 44 out of 44 said yes. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I can tell you, I have a very strong negative reaction to a virtual meeting where they come off and turn off the chat. And. It's funny because I only realized the relevance and importance of chat once I have repeated frustration with a big client of mine where they cannot use the chat as a default in their on their Zoom accounts. It is so frustrating. You're, you're missing an also, avenue of communication, right? Especially if I, I believe that as soon as I'm showing a slide... 50% of the participants open in another tab because it kind of, oh, she doesn't see me now anymore. I don't, I don't see them. They don't see me. So they get distracted. Oh, interesting. But I don't know what your experience is, but maybe I'm, yeah. Well, the other part too is as a facilitator, what I do is, uh, and again, you don't have to call anybody out. What you do is use acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. And so for instance, if I showed a slide, right? And um, it's slide is something you agreed with. I would add a line, which is like, oh, great. I see Miriam shaking her head, right? She must agree with the slide. So that's, I, I would use that to acknowledge the fact that, um, you know, in the opening part, I tell people, turn your cameras on. So even if we're spotlight or we have slides up, every speaker is, is designed to uh, be able to technically see you. Mm. And then the speakers then follow up with that, right? So they'll do things like, what's that box in your background, Miriam? You know, they're they're responding to and customizing the talk to respond to people in the audience. Mm. And that, that again, is a caging, an engaging piece. So it says that, um, right, the, the speaker can not only see stuff, but they're engaging with it. And a lot of people do miss this. They share a slide. If you have one screen and you share a slide, you lose your gallery and now you're presenting and now you're getting no audience feedback, even though they're giving it to you. Yeah. And so I, I think that, that you miss that part. I think going back to chat, right. Again, I, I love it when the chat blows up. I, even if they go off topic, I just had a friend who told me and he goes, he goes, sometimes he doesn't like when I chat because I am distracting. And I'm like, well, yeah, you know, but I'm also trying to help the conversation going. This is again, my personal viewpoint. You know, if I was chatting in his class, like I'd be a little more cautious to stay on topic, but I like the humor. In fact, sometimes the funniest things are the humor inside of there. Like here's here, I'll give you an example. In a class that I ran just last Friday, somebody talked about, and I, I bring people up, like half of my time in a presentation is bringing other people up and hearing their stories. And that's, so basically I'm facilitating the class. I'm not uh, right a peer, edu you know, lecturer, instructor. So I uh, and so I brought somebody up and she was from Petco, the company that right like, and so they were talking about pets and somebody made a very funny comment of like you know the funniest thing we've heard is when you name your pet grandpa or grandma, because all these funny sentences came out. Now the chat started to blow up about like I got to take grandpa to go to the bathroom outside now, 
<laughs> now it's totally off topic, but it was so funny. It was like the highlight of the class and that I, the instructor picked it up and started making grandpa and grandma jokes that I've never made before. <laughs> Right, because see, every time I did it, right, it's a repeated humor hit that yeah. goes. With and this it. creates bonding and a sense of belonging, and hence engagement. Got a shared experience. Yeah, there's no class that will ever use this grandpa grandma thing, yeah. <laughs> like like that, and have it be funny. And it's, yeah, what it brings up for me is the sense of competition and the illusion that we can control the attention of anyone in the first place. So it's like when hosting a workshop on site, forbidding cell phones and telling them, put your cell phones away. Well, if my content is not interesting enough um, to compete against a cell phone and some uh, Instagram <laughs> sliding, then maybe it's, it's on me. It's my responsibility. So if I don't trust that my content is, or my spoken word is engaging enough to compete against the chat, yeah. then maybe turning the chat off is not really the the winning strategy it's not the real solution it's it's a fixing yeah. the symptom and not the source yeah. right and here's a great example too uh, my very good friend tom singer is a keynoter and is, he specializes in in the closing keynote because he attends his goal he tells people i'll attend the whole conference and i'm going to customize my keynote to whatever happened at the conference mm. and then he told this really like a heart-wrenching story about his daughter getting this very advanced medical procedure right and was he got as he finished the story you know this was a conference and they were using twitter as the back channel mm -hmm. right? uh, and somebody then uh, tweeted out like at the end of his story going he goes that's the mark of a true closing keynote speaker right no tweets for the last eight minutes because everybody was tuned into this story to the point um, of like right, everything else went away and yeah. so I, I i very much believe that i i have a few examples of things like this and then you work to aspire to them mm. right so again think about can you can you run a 60 minute program virtual program with no slides with no other tech and it's no really, breakout rooms oh my god it challenged me yeah. yeah it honestly challenged me and now i can say i've done it but it took me like eight or ten months to actually like find the right material and, and the gumption to do it and have the have the confidence to do it but elizabeth gilbert like that's she naturally did it right off the bat because awesome. that's, that's what she does yeah <laughs> In your experience, what makes a workshop fail? Oh. You know, we're facilitators. And so in facilitators, almost everything is judged by the audience. And in an audience, right, uh, the worst failures I think I've seen is um, when your audience turns on you. Like they don't agree. Mm -hmm. Right? Or or there's a conflict. And then the worst part, I think, as a facilitator, is that you don't handle it correctly. Like, I feel like I've been able to take almost any conflict that happened in my class. And if you're a great facilitator, what we say is, like, it's akin to Aikido, right? So Aikido is the principle, mm -hmm. like, the Japanese art of, like, taking energy and redirecting it, mm -hmm. right? And so you can have a conflict in a class. And if you're smart, you can use it as a facilitator, Um. I, but I think some of the, the biggest failures from the facilitator side is to uh, make somebody wrong in the, the, in the audience, right? Going, no, you can't do that. Or that's not right. Mm. Um, I do the inverse, right? If somebody finds it, like I, I do a lot of team building right? and if somebody finds a new solution to a game, I will accept it that time. And then I'll decide, do I want to make a rule to have it never happen again? Or do I want to keep it there and allow it in the future? Mm -hmm. And then have a strategy for it. But sometimes I get surprised going, you know, what are we going to do with this? Yeah. I think the other the other parts um, then after the facilitator fails is just technical failures. Mm. Yeah. So, right. I think, you know, Jan Keck, our good friend, Jan Keck, mm -hmm. right? And Jan Keck, is, show. oh, my gosh, he's done something genius, which was he melted down technically on a, on one of his live virtual programs. And then he shared with it. And it was uh, the simple problem was he plugged a new USB device in and it like caused all his other stuff to intermittently fail. Yeah. And what everybody in the audience universally said afterwards was, what I learned more was not 
about technical or USB drives or even the content he originally said, what I really learned was how to gracefully handle when something is not going well. Mm. And they said that alone, right, gave me more than the value of the class that they expected. Wow. And what was it specifically? Do you remember? Uh, oh, some of what, them what did are, be for you? Well, the first one is state management. And what I mean by state management is, is your own personal state. Mm. So even if you are panicking in your head, going, this camera's not working, right? This poll's not here. All this stuff is like I'm expecting, right? I didn't send the, these questions to, to John, blah, blah, blah. They're all here, right? Even if they're here, they don't they don't show up here and mm -hmm, here. In your face. Mm-hmm. So, and what Jan, Jan is, you know, already personality wise, if you've never seen him, even, even my audience said this, says that I love his, his presence. Because mm -hmm. one of the things Jan would do would be to keep his speech at this slower rate. He would going, you know, and maybe even describe some of the things that he's doing to you. So, you know, I mean, one, he needs to communicate to you when we're having challenges Just let people know, for the most part, it should be okay. Um, try new things. And then have a fallback plan, right? Even if it doesn't work. If he still has a mic and a camera on, you can still do things. Yeah. Right? Even though all the stuff he expected to do isn't there. That actually happened to me once. I, I took my computer out to run a hybrid program. So I have to disassemble a good portion of my setup. And oh, by the way, here, wait, I put a new camera in Miriam, right? This is this is the setup that I'm talking to Miriam on right now. Wow. So I just recommend anyone to watch the YouTube video anyway, <laughs> and specifically for this part. Because what you're seeing now is I have like, a, you know, it's, uh, up to 16 screens yeah, uh, to my disposal. <laughs> Right. Miriam can see that I, she's here, right? She can actually see I'm running PowerPoint over here. So that's how I, I brought in PowerPoint earlier. Um, and so it's a, basically what it is. It's a lot of tech. And when this tech doesn't work, right, it can all fall apart. Right? This is this is like thousands of failing fasters to decide what actually works every day and that I can actually rely on. Um, and so I brought my computer in and when Zoom would run, it would crash intermittently. Um, every about every like five to six minutes and i'm trying to teach a class right and um what i end up doing i had to abandon this computer and i had two laptops over here on my side so while my producer was talking to the class while i was you know crashing and uncrashing i set up another laptop and just went old school mm -hmm. All right And and I, luckily, I have some of the resources to still use things like uh, PowerPoint as virtual background because I went through a whole phase of develop of, of presenting like that, even if I don't do it now. And so I was able to run it completely off a laptop. And what I told them too, it was a, it was a class called you know turn on the damn camera, and I, I used it. I said, let me just uh, I'm going to pause for a second and just share with you a moment of vulnerability, which is part of psychological safety. Right, is that when things don't happen in class the way you want to, they can unnerve you as a facilitator. And one of your jobs is to figure out can you can you go on, mm. right? And if you can show that you can go on, sometimes you'll win even more, because now people have seen how you dealt with failure. Yeah, this is what we call the power of vulnerability. Right, the power of vulnerability is like really showing people, you know, you're not perfect. And I think that helps, you know, like like everyone's talking about imposter syndrome right now. If you, one of the ways I think to diffuse imposter syndrome is to um, just share, right? Like maybe I'm having this vulnerable moment right now, right? And then I think the the comeback for it too, though, is that you have you find you find a way to overcome it. Yes. In that moment. And. What comes to my mind is um, is Brene Brown and what she says about shame, because imposter syndrome vulnerability is closely related to shame and yeah. shame cannot survive or can only survive in secrecy. So the moment we speak it out and we share it, um, there's no more shame. And hence we, yeah, we feel liberated and we can connect to others. I just I got the, this message in two way, two totally different ways uh, this week. One is there's a book called um, Hardball by Chris Matthews, and it's all about politics. Mm -hmm. 
And one of the ways they say about bad news is to you deliver it. So you get ahead of it and you can control the messaging of it. Mm hmm. Right. Because otherwise, like you said, audience that goes bad it, when an audience starts complaining, like, you know, your audio is bad, your video is bad, what everything is going on. You, if you get ahead of it yes. and just let people know, then then you they know that at least you're aware of it. The other place that I thought was really unusual. Do you remember the movie uh, Eight Mile or the rapper Eminem? Yes, yes, yes. You know, in, in the way he won the battle was that he took away all the things that the guy was going to like, basically in a rap battle is that you try and like, you know, cut each other down. Mm -hmm. And he took everything away from the guy who was going to battle him. Right. He, he said it, he goes, I already know you're going to talk about all these things. Right. So I'll just do it first. And then mm. the other guy had nothing to talk about. And just and the audience up. loved him for this authenticity and um, yes. It was big. It was really a big reversal that I, I kind of forgot about, you know, because now he's, you know, obviously he's famous and now he has all these things, but he came from not a lot. He did he that trailer park story is real for him. His mom was not necessarily the nicest person. That was real too. And he found a way to get out of that. Yeah. So authenticity. Yeah, not it's to... often too, yeah. Like he he cut himself down first. Yeah. And he goes, I acknowledge that. That's actually, if you go back and watch the final scene, he acknowledged he comes from a trailer that he, you know, that he he lives in a trailer park. He lives with his mom instead of letting that other person do it. And he would feel shame before. But if all you got to do is come in, like, oh, that's one thing I can tell uh, facilitators is like, if you own your stuff, all right, if you can find your authenticity, then it's very rare that another attendee will knock you off center as a facilitator. Yeah. Has it ever happened to you that a participant would say, I'm not doing that. I'm not participating. Oh yeah. 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 You, uh, Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. You want to hear a great story, please. I'm doing a team building event, this geocaching event in Houston. All right. And it's with a really big oil company. Right. And um, I'm doing a team building event and it's about cross team collaboration. So the setup is you're competing um, against all the other teams. There's like six different teams, but there's also a company goal that if you collaborate and you all you find all of the locations that are in Houston, um, you, you'll win a company prize. Right. And no one team can do it. I spent I sp spread them apart too, too far. So it's almost it's impossible for one team to do them. Anyways, we get to the midpoint. Right. And I uh, do a debrief of all the teams and then I let them know. And I was like, well, if we end the game right now, you know, you just haven't, you haven't achieved the company goal. Right. I just want to let you know that. So, you know, and then I give them a debrief time normally to, to figure out, do you want to do something different? Mm -hmm. Before I could even say that this guy, this old guy stands up, old guy, white hair comes up and he goes, he goes, well, it's your fault that we didn't collaborate. In a Oops. very accusatory tone. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't joking, right? He, like, I felt it going, oh my gosh, he's accusing me. Like, it's my fault. And that facilitator Akito immediately kicked in. This is this is what happens when you get a 20-year facilitator and not a one- or two-year facilitator. Because I could have felt hurt by that. I could have felt defensive against that. And, and, and it just, again, this is my intuition running around. This is what you work on all the time as facilitator because you only have a split second too mm -hmm. you you can't think of like the perfect answer and like you know flow charted you don't have time to do that so i thought about it right and one of the best things i can tell facilitators who are listening to this is what i call agree and frame mm -hmm. in frame right agree a frame is like improv's yes and mm -hmm. So that's what comes to me. And I'm going, can I do this? And I go, yeah, right. So that's what's happening. Like in a split second, I have to come in and I'm like, you know what? And he goes, what? He goes, you're right. And he goes, huh? <laughs> you, now his brain is completely confused. Mm -hmm. I go, you know what? You're right. You're right. You're right that it's my fault that your team didn't collaborate. But you're also right. And now I can now we figured out what the path was, right? You're also right that there are nine teams in the world who I've given the exact same goals and rules to who did collaborate and scored the highest score possible. And you're right, right? 
that probably about 90 plus percent of the teams that I give these same two goals and five rules to, right, uh, didn't collaborate. So you know what? You are absolutely correct, right? I said, would you like to say anything else about that? And he goes, no, I'd like to sit down now. And awesome. yeah, uh, and then later on, the woman who hired me for this, who had been working with the team like on a, on a coaching basis for over a year, said that was amazing. Number two, he has a challenge where he has attacked multiple people inside the company with his authentic with his authoritarianness to get his way. All right, and she saw she's never seen anybody stand up to him because then mm -hmm. I learned then because I didn't know this is my ignorance, which is great. He's like one of the top oceanographer mappers in the world, which makes him super <laughs> valuable to the oil company. So nobody's willing to take him on, but I I didn't know. And he I mean, came back. Mm -hmm. He came back afterwards at the end of the class, and he thanked me. Congratulations. It reminds me of something that I've learned from a Harvard professor. I was sitting in a, um, he was coming over to Germany for, um, to teach a class. Mm. And whoever in the class said something that was wrong, his reply would always be, yes, and have you thought of, and then say the exact opposite. <laughs> and it's genius. <laughs> And I think it's if there's one thing that facilitators shall learn is exactly that, because with a yes, and that's also what you did. Yes, I agree. So you you open. He becomes curious. Everyone loves to be yes and right. Well, and it's, the, it's the acknowledgement. Yeah, yeah. that he, he, he expect he wanted the fight. Mm. So he th he thought he said something like, and again, ninety percent of the planet would say, "No, you're wrong." Right. And he wanted that. He wanted me to say that so that he could fight. Either they would say, no, you're wrong. Most of the facilitators, I assume, would say, oh, please elaborate or let me know why. Or I'm curious. And then suddenly you give this person a stage and yeah. you're losing yeah. control and everyone yes. becomes kind of, oh, it's like standing around two guys who might fight or might not. <laughs> And then the chat will explode. But you basically, yeah, you didn't give him a stage and you didn't make him wrong. Right. So basically you opened the door. Yes, 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 yes. And then we're like, and here's the exit. <laughs> and he took it. Yeah. That, and and he thank you for it. Yeah. And, and then and later on, yeah, I think, well, because, you know, high performers like that too. Um, I, I've done a lot of work for team building for high performer um mm. Uh, programs in companies and high performers quite often get very little feedback all they get is feedback is like you're great Miriam you are awesome right and after a while you become numb to it because you're like none of this is helping me I'm like well that's fine okay I understand that but it's not helping me in my career so you know um, it takes a certain kind of person to give that person very real and authentic feedback mm. and that's something that us as facilitators need to do And again, there's no science to it. There are times when I've given feedback and um, you might not receive it, right? And you're like, oh, I don't believe that or that that does not relevant. But, you know, like this feedback my, my friend gave me and he goes, he he actually caught himself. He goes, he goes, I don't like how you chat, right? And then and then later on, he goes, I don't like how you chat sometimes right? <laughs> in my meetings. <laughs> and it's just this is a personal preference that I wasn't uh, hurt by, but I was, you know, It was important for me to hear because I think I know that, right? It's kind of like when you raise your hand too many times in class, mm. <laughs> right? I, I need to figure out, like right now, I'm trying to figure out, like, when is that moment in chat? Because um, mm. there are times when I can, like, like I can dominate a chat and I can also um, really light up a chat. And there are times when I shouldn't do that, like when it's not my class. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very thin line. It's a very thin line. Yeah. There's no right answer except for what works. And then and then it's also it depends also on the group. It's it's not a zero one. So what might be raising the hand once too much or putting a comment in the chat once too often for in one group context might be totally different in a in another group context. Totally agree. It, every 
every virtual audience has its own culture, whether you know what it is or not. Yeah. Um, what yeah. is your number one facilitation challenge? After 25 years. Your number one facilitation I think what I've been really talking about now is to like we're two years into pandemic and the real challenge is going deeper. Right. I think that everybody can master the, the, the touch levels of, of engagement or facilitation on the high level. Right. Which is, it's just a bunch of techniques. And You know, I think everybody, it goes back to what you said earlier. Uh, my my definition was, is that humans are designed to connect. And des humans are also designed to create meaning. And therefore, in a virtual program now too, like I believe it's highly possible to run transformational programs on virtual. Sometimes it's better. Sometimes it's easier. Sometimes it costs less. Right? Um, and so if you learn to take advantage of those formats, Now the challenge is, is how do we facilitate so we can get to a deeper part? Like, for instance, I am using Patrick Lencioni's exercise, which is um, tell a ch challenging childhood story. So I and I share one as a leader and I'll tell a real story. And quite often people change their story. I'll, I'll put them in breakout. So there's just two people and, you know, they have, you know, six to eight minutes to share a childhood story apiece. And universally it has worked. It's amazing. Uh, in that way. And then, and then you can tackle a deeper topic. Mm -hmm. And I just, I just reused this. I had two companies that were fighting and they asked us to do a team building event. And after talking with like one of the groups, there was like a Taiwan group and a, and a U.S. group, the U.S. group, fundamentally, I came back and said, I think the worst idea that we could do is run a three hour fun team building event. And they all five execs said, Oh my God, you are, we, we agree. Yes. I said, now, if there's something we can do to really help this, would you still use the three hours? And they'll go like, yes, anything, as long as you can change the course. We started with that exercise and did a couple of other things, um, but designed those three hours to be uh, such in that way. And by the end of the three hours, they both Taiwan and the U.S. side said, we feel like we've made some repair of our relationship. Beautiful. And, and it was, I did not know if it was going to work or not, Miriam. It was challenging. So thank you. Mm. So to me, like that, how do we get deeper? Because we couldn't, if without if that virtual three-hour meeting was surface, we would have never, they would have left and said this was a waste of time. And I wonder whether it would have been possible um, on site to the same degree. So I would even say that it's, if well done, it's easier to go deeper online than offline. Just because we have this protective space protected space because it takes one of those similar to the dominant person you you referenced before if yeah. he speaks up in an on-site he can he can empoison empoison how do you call that um yeah. the entire room yeah no he could definitely influence right whatever that yeah. positive or negatively and maybe if this guy is in a in a breakout with just one other person telling telling a vulnerable story maybe he might or at least he would just spoil eight minutes of one person and not of an entire room yeah i agree i think there's two parts I, i'm I'm always going to say uh, despite being highly virtual right that it most likely would have been easier in person but in this case it was actually uh, not not um Not possible, at least for the, the the part of the reason why the riff created is that they used to uh, visit each other one way or the other in person, like two to four times a year. Mm. And with coronavirus, it actually made it impossible because of both Taiwan's uh, coronavirus protocols and the U.S.'s. So like flying over there means you got to quarantine for 14 days and then flying home, you got to quarantine 14 days and like no executive could take a month off. Right to, to, to validate. Well, oh, 14 it. days in a quarantine hotel together. This can create some strong bonds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe they should. Yeah, they should have read it that way. 28 days a month. Yeah, that's actually a funny idea. Um, yeah, but that was the challenge. Like again, it was like not possible, and so, um, and the reason why I think in person is is easier 
it just it actually comes down to a very funny technical piece. This is what I call my theory of bandwidth. And so theory of bandwidth is like, um, right, there's text, like emails, right? Then there's audio, like the phone. Then there's like video conference like this, right? And then there's in person. And it's just, this gives you the largest number, amount of bandwidth. Like it's nearly mm -hmm. infinite. You can do things like smell or, or taste or touch that you can't do over here. And, and then what I also tell people too, is like, you can get a sense of the room obviously better on, on in person, right? Cause you're getting all that information from people, whether it's chemical pheromones or, or it's energy, um, you know, it's possible, it's harder, it's different here in virtual, but with the highest amount of bandwidth, then you have the most amount of information to work with as a facilitator. For extroverts, yes, I agree. For introverts, I don't agree. Mm, because it's more, it's more democratic online where everyone has the same chance to be to to get into a breakout room with the highest paid person in the room um the zoom gods decide <laughs> yeah and who who dares to to stay at the bar and at the end to have the chit chat that might have a big impact on your career it's a yeah. it's a specific type of person who would end up there to dare to get drunk with the ceo right yes um And on Zoom, maybe nobody gets drunk with the CEO or everyone together. <laughs> so yes, I think most people prefer the on-site events because of the booze or the food. But <laughs> otherwise, I think when it comes to um, efficiency, um, democracy, equity, inclusion. I definitely agree that the, um, I've heard the introverts tell me that they're loving the virtual space, right? Yeah. Because it gives them the time to really think too about something again, like, like part of this improv is not, not everybody's mode. And so, and, but, and quite often what I tell people in my team building programs is that the introvert is the one that gets the right answer mm. because they actually, well, number one, they're the only one listening. <laughs> <laughs> the introvert shout out to the world, right? And the second one is then, therefore, if they're listening, they can process all the data and come out to the solution. And um, I, again, I've told people that um, I've seen an introvert change an entire virtual meeting, mm. sometimes off of one chat and sometimes off of one comment. Mm. Yeah. And yeah. and happen, same happens uh, on site. And the same happens yeah. on site. Again, yeah, if they can yeah. find a way to, to be um, at their best, right? Which is like, Again, sort of for me, like if I was introverting, you know, I'd be taking notes, I'd writing a journal, and, and somehow or another, I synthesize something that nobody got. Mm -hmm. And and again, introverts don't do it; they're thinking about the next thing they're going to say. <laughs> what do you, what's your what's your opinion about hybrid? Well, I love Jan's uh, that definition, which was very challenging, which is like it's the worst of both worlds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I find that interesting. I don't I don't have that belief myself. I think that hybrid uh, can be great. I think hybrid here what I love too is uh, I think we talked a little bit about it, right? So you know what FOMO is. Mm -hmm. Right. But the now fear of missing you, out. Have you ever had reverse FOMO? I would be curious what reverse FOMO means. So one of my friends' conference, which is about presentations, called the Presentation Summit, has a conference and he really, he ran it hybrid because this was his return to, you know, doing in person. And, and it was smart. He, he really had some design principles, you know, one, give everyone a choice. Mm -hmm. right? And number two was, um, uh, was to design to try and prevent FOMO. He was very conscious to be trying to prevent FOMO for those who are coming in virtually. So for instance, he didn't want to run any programming like in the, the in-person cocktail. Like there's a very difficult to replicate a great virtual experience with an in-person cocktail hour, right? Yeah, yeah. Although it's important, right? That's where you, sometimes my, my best connections were made at the informal cocktail party where I got to meet somebody who got my friends with. So anyway, so he did that, but um. Later on, right, I was the virtual MC. So my job was to take care of the virtual audience. So I would do things like engage the virtual audience while he was getting ready or the tech team was about to come up. So five or 10 minutes, you know, ahead of time, I would come in, do some things. And then when the live programming came on, I would go to that. And then my job was to continue to engage them. And actually, I helped them prevent technical problems and like communicate to the audience much faster. Anyways, that was my value to them. 
um, the whole virtual audience was online for something we just did. And then we were all supposed to log off and jump to the next link for the next meeting. And somebody goes, hey, wait a minute. They canceled something on the program. And I didn't even get the notes, right? And the program, this next section was called five minutes. Mm -hmm. Five minutes was in-person people were supposed to be able to sign up and then give a five-minute tip on like present presenting on PowerPoint or whatever it was. And so... Uh, they like, they canceled this meeting, right? So, you know, and I checked it, they go, yeah, we canceled it. And so all the in-person people had dispersed and I had, but I had all the virtual people online and, and somebody in the virtual audience goes, hey, wait a minute. I wrote one of those five minutes was supposed to present. Does somebody want to hear it? <laughs> nice. And what happens, Miriam, in the next 60 minutes is like one of the best engaging 60 minutes of virtual that I've had in the last two years. Right. It was spontaneous. It was authentic. It was vulnerable. It was valuable. I got 12 presentation tips, despite being a 25 year user on PowerPoint that I'd never heard before. Wow. And Just so that popped up. Yeah. Somebody, spontaneously minutes, yeah, somebody, 60 else, minutes. Awesome. somebody else goes, Hey, I have a five minute too. And then somebody else goes, well, I don't have one, but I have a tip. And so like, it just like, it just, you know, like it's the, the momentum stacked on, on each other halfway through Rick uh, is the uh, Rick Altman is the um, conference organizer. And I, I go, dude, Rick, you got to log in, right? You got to check this out. So he logs in and he's blown away. Like he's watching and he's seeing how much energy is in the group and how much value is coming in there. And then he, he private chat me and he goes, hey, do you mind spotlighting me after this, this session? I'm like, yeah, sure. I'm like, hey, let's welcome Rick Altman. So Rick comes in there and he goes, I spent all this time designing for FOMO. And now I have to worry about designing for reverse FOMO <laughs> <laughs> because the virtual is so good that the in-person audience is missing out. Awesome. So that's my theories around hybrid are um, I do believe an MC is really helpful because then you have somebody to help manage the audience all the time. That's direct connected to the technical team because there's a lot of tech that mm -hmm. has to happen to get hybrid right. Um, and then the second part around that is, is sometimes the virtual is more valuable. And what I've also seen in another conference is that because of the chat, like going back to what we talked about in chat, that chat is so valuable because um, all the other experts are there who are attendees and they're chatting all these resources. So let's say Miriam talks about facilitation, five people like chat their like favorite facilitation book. You should read this. You should read this. And put in links that in an in-person event, you cannot have access unless you have a Twitter channel. Yeah. Or, yeah. you know, what I would do is I would encourage people to log into the Zoom <clears throat> but like you may either turn their camera off just just for the chat all right you have to disconnect your audio so you don't echo yeah but you could you could participate in this way um mm. and so now you can having you're going back we're going back to jimbo clark you're having this digital experience which is part of it is physical which is the in-person audience and part of this is digital yeah love that so i think hybrid can make it but and it it has to be produced correctly uh and and there are there are a lot of technical things i think you have to do and i think there's a lot of this um in person uh, human things that we need to do to do it to the best level yes and something that you said was striking and that's something else that i cannot put my finger on it, when you said rick you have to log in to to get that. And he logged in and immediately sensed the high energy and that there was engagement and something going on. And yes, I know I know how it feels to, to be in a virtual space and to feel this energy, although you don't smell the pheromones. <laughs> well, and this kind of gets to our like cosmic level, right? This is like quantum physics happening. Right. Because us as humans, we're, we can feel connected to somebody halfway across the planet. Yeah. And so that's why I think that's where the hope of virtual is to me, is that, you know, as a facilitator, your job is to help people discover that. Right. How do, how do you feel connected to people? Because everyone says it's disconnecting. I don't agree with that. I mean, like this right now, we, I feel very connected to you right? and you are in another country. And yeah. so the technology has gotten good enough so that we can do this. Again, you have to use the tech in a certain way, I think, to get that. And 
as humans, we're designed to do this. All we have to do is figure out how to unlock it. And it's Precisely. so new. Yeah, it's so new that not everybody knows all the ways to how to do it yet. Unfortunately. And I think we're, we're getting there. So I'm definitely on a mission. I know, I know that you are. <laughs> and there are a few others. We recently had um, a meetup with, a, with my um, community. Mm. And there were 15, I think one, Michelle came all the way from Australia. So we thought, okay, whoever is in the city or close to it, we all meet in Amsterdam. And the only thing that was surprising was where the body dimensions of each other. <laughs> there was, otherwise, it felt as if we've been together in the same space for the last two years. So it didn't feel strange to hug. It didn't feel strange that it was the first time. It was just like, oh, I didn't imagine that you would be that tall. Or, oh, you are quite short. <laughs> It's, well, this is kind of egalitarian, right? Everyone has to be the size of their monitor. Yeah. So there is that part yeah. that you don't know. And, and maybe that's a plus. Yeah. Yeah. So um, that was the only surprising thing. That's great. I prepared all these kind of ice melters and to overcome the kind of weirdness and awkwardness of meeting in person. I was the only person who kind of felt awkward. And sometimes I was sitting there. I miss my Zoom. Oh, oh yeah, there's definitely some people Introvert. fatigue going on, right? There's yes. some people people fatigue. You know, we just had some friends over for uh, lunch yesterday with their family, and they got three kids, and and it's a lot of work. Can we please put them into a breakout room? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Can we put the three children, right? <laughs> the youngest in his own breakout room, he can play with his brother. Uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I think. Again, we're humans, we easily adapt. Now that's two years into this pandemic, right? I mean, it was a challenge, don't get me wrong. And if you do anything long enough, it becomes like a habit, right? And then we become used to it. And now the other thing is much more challenging, whatever that other thing is. Yeah. Yeah. True. Wow. Thank you, John. You're welcome. Thank you. What an amazing conversation. Yes. Is there anything that you would have wanted to share but didn't get the opportunity to? Uh, can I share about my conference? Absolutely. So, so we are recording this in August, and I think it goes live in October, September, October 2022. October 2022. Well, hopefully it'll be just in time, but it doesn't matter because it is um, uh, annual. Good. So that even if you get this every October, we run a conference called the Engaging Virtual Meetings Conference. And uh, Jimbo has been a speaker. Young's been a speaker. Miriam has not yet been a speaker. So I'll give you that not yet, right? Yay! <laughs> um, I feel half invited. <laughs> <laughs> I would love for you to attend. Actually, I'd love to actually, if you are interested in free on some of these dates, um, I'll let you know if a, a spot opens up because some of my speakers have not yet fully confirmed. It's, it's called the Engaging Virtual Meetings Conference. I started and now celebrates. Um, uh, we started what the oh the year the book released October 2020. So now it's like an annual thing. It's always uh, the third week I think in October, Tuesday through Saturday. Um, this year's theme is called the New Norm. Love and it. if you remember the very funny television show in America called Cheers, there's a guy who comes into the bar. His name is Norm. <laughs> Right. We believe he's going to visit us virtually here. Uh, so that's going to be the new norm. But to, to me, the new norm is like what the new norm should be, Miriam. Right. Which the new norm is like we actually have our cameras on if like we can. Right. The new norm is that we actually learn how to participate. The new norm is we learn how to go deeper emotionally here on virtual. Right. The new norm is that we have great meeting facilitators. And so anyways, there's a free ticket and uh, I'll make sure that Miriam has a link uh, or it's engaging virtual meetings dot com slash conference. If it you miss the show notes, that, that's right. Uh, and if you um, there is a ticket you can upgrade to, uh, you can also catch the recordings for it. But then the the, uh, the ninety seven dollar ticket uh, you get in Zoom as, as opposed to watch it on YouTube. So, you you know, that you're having a more inclusive experience. Um, I'll give you all the video recordings for all my previous conferences, which includes 60 hours of amazing. It's so great now to actually go back to and watch the progression of speakers. They are progressing very fast year over year. What you see in 2020 was like, 
oh, that was really good for 2020, but man, geez, now look what we're doing in 2022. And you'll see all these techniques, right? And then uh, you get a VIP membership, which is that you're part of our community um, where I run uh, monthly meetings where I share the latest in uh, in what's happening in the virtual meeting space. So yeah, awesome. so that's my conference. And and uh, again, I, I'm not sure if it's, it's nine o'clock to one o'clock Pacific Standard Time. And we're talking about working on a version that will soon be... Uh, other time zone friendly. Awesome. I'll put all of that in the show notes and make sure that the episode gets released before the conference. Yay. Right? <laughs> That's uh, no uh, FOMO. <laughs> FOMO minimization. Wonderful. FOMO. <laughs> I, I got to use that word, FOMO minimization. I get, that's, a, that's a great word I need to use. Thank you, John. Dum, da, da, dum. That's the end of my podcast.